Ready? Don't need this towel anymore, though. This is traveling this during science. the show. Yeah. Justin's doing some traveling. I'll keep my towel with me, Justin. He's hitchhiking. Case. Hitchhiking a little bit. Hey, everyone. This is This Week in Science, and we are here, hopefully without any uh, technical difficulties for the rest of the show. And two birthdays. Two birthdays, which is very exciting. Very exciting. So, should we start the show? Are you ready, Justin? Blair, are you ready to start the show? Should we just go? I'm always ready. Lose it. Justin is a better American. It's bitter. Um, <laughs> bitter <laughs> American beer. And it's got the, the uh, first uh, ape in space. <laughs> it's a birthday present, which I will be consuming live on the air. Uh, I'm it's drinking so vodka. 21st Amendment. I think they're in it's San Francisco good. Brewery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shall we do some radio magic? Yes. All right. Let me see. Let's. Uh, let me give me a few minutes to write a disclaimer. Typey tippity tapity tap tap tap. Okay, we're good. Typey tippity tap. And starting show in T minus. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! As we enter this holiday season, a great deal of effort will be made to encourage others to be more generous to the less fortunate. Tremendous need will be met by tremendous outpouring of goods, truly helping many whose winter months would be much bleaker if not for these efforts. And while this is a great and worthy cause, I ask you to pay attention to one greater need this season, poverty of the mind. And in this endeavor, I ask you to remain so rigidly objective as to look upon yourself as though you were another person. And give generously to yourself that knowledge which you have been lacking your entire life. I am not you, with which both of us should have noticed by now, and so I cannot tell you which bit of knowledge you are currently lacking, yet have pondered and puzzled over in solitary moments over the years. But there is something that you have always wondered about or wanted to learn more about or how it works or how to do it. You may need to search inward a bit. It could be high up on a shelf of half-remembered daydreams or entangled in dust bunnies swept under a rug of unanswered questions. Or it could be there, now, burning in your mind, front and center, is the one thing you've always wondered about but keep forgetting to Google. The generous act I ask you to do this year is to figure out that's something you don't know and learn it. Learn the crap out of it. Though at some point, anything we encounter in this world asks us a thousand questions that are stored, swept, filtered, forgotten, and eventually lost. We try here each week to discover these lost questions and to introduce even more answers when possible. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen. Science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin. And happy, 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 happy birthday! Oh, Not just to you, but yeah, to Blair too. Yeah, we mm. got two, two birthdays: <laughs> birthday girl, birthday boy. Happy birthday, <laughs> science to you. Wait, wait, happy don't birthday, sing that. Science don't take it. Come on, to you. The... No, you can't sing that song. It's a uh, happy heavily, science birthday. Heavily, no, it's heavily birthday, birthday, to birthday, you. Birthday, what birthday. day is today? It's happy science Justin's birthday, birthday to you. No. 
<laughs> it's not Justin's birthday. It was. It's not your birthday anymore. It was. It was. It was. It's yeah. And it's not 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 anymore to nope, that also comic happened. clock people. That also happened. But we'll, we'll get that again in another 100 years. So it's not yeah. like a real big deal. Well, not, wait, 83 Yeah, it's not years? quite 100 years. <laughs> How is it not a hundred years that we won't until well, we have another oh, twelve, 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 twelve? Oh, but that's not twelve, 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 twelve. Right. I'm talking about the twelves. Yeah, we'll have a ones. We'll have, we'll have all kinds of those. Will keep coming. Fair enough. Decklers, <laughs> and we have another special day coming up. Also, the end of the world, December twenty first. It's coming, folks. It's really coming. And you know what we have? Do you know what we have oh, what? What's coming for us? Dun, 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 dun. The end of Just the world? The end of the world. Mm. Or perhaps. The world as we know it will soon come to an end. 28 minutes, 10 seconds to impact. 21 hours. Twist. Forget it. Nice. Yes, the Twistmageddon. This is going to be an experiment of fun. 21 hours. We are going to be broadcasting on uh, YouTube and Google Plus just for the fun of the science of it and to see if we're still here, which we very likely will be because as if you've listened to this show, especially as we all know here, it's not a little secret either. We should spread it widely that uh, the idea that there's a Mayan prophecy that the world is going to end is uh, based on false assumptions so yeah. um, <laughs> to say the very least very yes. least yeah highly unscientific and I really do expect to be here and I expect to be able to chat with Blair yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we have we have a good 15 years before the robots take over and destroy us all and they, yeah. but they won't destroy all of us. They will keep some of us as their pets. So we still have, <laughs> we still have options. Yeah. So, uh, but if you go to our website, there is some more information about Twistmageddon. And we hope that you will join us on December 21st for all the fun that we will have. But now, wait a sec. Wait a sec. Are we doing it on the 21st? Well, Are we the, actually the, doing it on the 20th? It's the 20th it's and 21st. countdown to the... And then we're doing it for zone. a few hours afterwards also. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not, so not starting, quite a countdown. We're starting at 4 p.m. PST, right? Yes. Okay. Live on the yes. Google Plus network. At 0 so, hours universal <laughs> coordinated time. Yes. That information is on the website. Nice. Right. Yeah. right. What did yeah. you bring today, talk... Kirsten? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We talk about details later. Let's get into the stories. So uh, today I have stories, if I can find them. I have stories about rivers of hydrocarbons. Yeah. NASA once again deciding to smash things into the moon. Uh, venomous mammals or and venomous primates. What? <laughs> I, I need to learn more about this and maybe a story about boxed wine. <laughs> <laughs> what did you bring, Justin? I've got uh, raccoons going viral. Uh, frog milk is actually good for you, uh, as Russians have known for years. I've got uh, a black hole discovery and two, two different fossil stories that are intriguing. To say the least. Hmm. Hmm. Like intriguing fossils, and Blair, what does the animal corner have for us? Have in store for us tonight? I have some fish where acting gay improves your fitness. Interesting. Also, <laughs> zebra finches and um, kind of a nature versus nurture thing. Nice. Yeah. I like the nature and nurture. I, 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 know, I don't think it's so versus, but we'll talk about no, that. No, no. The secret is it's both. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Just so you know. 
Thanks for sharing. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's great. I feel like I'm part of a secret club now. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so jumping into rivers of hydrocarbons. Um, so looking at um, a giant moon, the giant moon Titan that orbits around Saturn has been uh, captured on multiple recording devices by the Cassini mission, and they've been, NASA and the ESA have been trying to figure out more and more about Titan, uh, what its surface is like, what kind of um, uh, an environment there is there. And it was announced by the European Space Agency uh, just yesterday that they found a 400 kilometer long river that flows into a sea. River run to the sea. And uh, that river is not frozen. It's if it were water, it'd be frozen, but it's flowing, and it's made of hydrocarbons, simple hydrocarbons, ethane, methane, and uh, it's it's just going to show. We ta we've talked about places like Titan being uh, models for Earth, but just with different liquids, so just without water being liquid, having these different liquids, and I just I. I love the idea of these rivers and seas that exist but are so different from our own. Uh, that's wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're going to continue the Cassini mission through 2017, so we should be getting some more information about Saturn and Titan and the other moons um, uh, of Saturn for at least the next three, four years or so, four or five years, and there'll probably be even more data um, beyond that. We'll see. We'll see. They uh, they might burn it up in Saturn's atmosphere when they decide to end it, which just it seems for kicks, or? Just, yeah, just for kicks, and that seems to be like the 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 modus operandi of space agencies. And when we're done with this, we will send this craft into the atmosphere of the planet it is observing and it will burn up and just go away. Or it will smash into it. Hmm. And um, that's what's happening on Monday. So Monday, NASA's uh, twin orbiters, they're the Grail twins that are named Ebb and Flow. They've been orbiting uh, around the moon mapping its gravity and its interior um, and it's, their mission is over they're almost out of fuel and NASA is going to crash them into the surface of the moon hmm. on Monday yes uh, they think they're going to probably break into a bunch of pieces as they strike in a dark area of the moon um, it's not really a mountain they're calling it a massive um, and it's more of a rim near a crater called Goldschmidt that they're going to be crashing into. Um, and they don't really have a name for the, the mission's final resting place. However, uh, the crash, this is on purpose, and they can avoid... They're crashing it into this particular place so they can avoid damaging any... Uh, sites of special interest that are already on the moon. So uh, Apollo sites, Russian landing sites, um, important places that, you know, are probably going to be uh, tourist hotspots at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Historical moon sites. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I thought there was these were really fun ideas. I, they've, they, they crashed a probe into the moon uh, was it a year ago or so? Trying to get a plume of dust out of it to see if they could see any water, any uh, traces of water in the dust and other minerals and uh, just see what is contained in the dust on the surface of the moon. And it didn't quite go as spectacularly as people hoped it would, but they did get a lot of great information out of that. So I don't know if they're going to be um, looking for uh, information from this impact or not. 
but the Grail, the Grail uh, Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, these two crafts have done an amazing job of mapping the moon's interior and giving us an idea of its weird gravitational field, <laughs> where gravity is strongest and weakest on, on its surface. It's quite fascinating, yes. And just fun. I mean, smashing something into the moon is just... I mean, even if it is just for kicks, even if they get no data, it's... Like... I know. We've got... Yeah, uh, Twit Refugee says, dark area or not, it's still littering. I know. It is, but I mean, <laughs> what, would, what would we... What else would we have... What else would we do? These things are running out of fuel. Mm -hmm. They're either going to crash into the moon on their own if uh, we didn't control it, or maybe float away if they were able to escape the gravity of the moon. Um... And then there would just be floating space debris, which could be problematic. Yeah, and it's a good kind of littering. It's a, it's like a time capsule up there. Yeah. Pretty soon, though, the surface of the moon is going to be junkyard central. Yeah. <laughs> what you got there, Justin? So I have the wisdom of the ancients, now being ancient myself. Uh, wisdom of the ancients is often filled with folklore old wives' tales, downright kooky cures and ailments uh, for diseases that are perhaps real or imagined. Uh, the people of the past had very little understanding of science, and like we are in, you know, how the human body worked as we do in our modern age. Uh, in Denmark, one of the ancient cures was for leg cramps was placing a potato under the foot of the bed, which is kind of interesting because I've heard potassium. Like, you're supposed to get more potassium if you have leg cramps, which I think potatoes mm -hmm. have. So maybe having proximity of potatoes makes you eat more potatoes and therefore it does cure it. But <laughs> the actual cure <laughs> called for placing the potato under the foot of the bed. Uh, Old-fashioned Russian way of keeping a bucket of milk from going sour? Put a frog in it. <laughs> That's kind of gross. <clears throat> right? But, uh, not to mention, not very healthy, depending on the frog. You're right. Yeah. So uh, while many a solution of old has been abandoned in the light of scientific understanding, we might at times be too quick to discount the trial and error experimentation of our citizen scientists of the past. Uh, recent modern-day researchers took a look at one of these practices of the past and found it may indeed have some sort of merit. They have identified a wealth of new antibiotic substances in the skin of the Russian brown frog. The kind you might find sloshing around in a, in a pail of milk. <laughs> of rural <laughs> Russian milk. Yeah. This is uh, uh, a, a, uh, this is study appears in the ACS Journal of Proteome Research A.T. Lebedev and colleagues explain that amphibians secrete antimicrobial substances called peptides through their skin. These compounds make up the majority of their skin's secretions and act as a first line of defense against bacteria and other microorganisms that thrive in the wet places that frogs, toads, salamanders, and other amphibians like to call home. Previous study identified on the skin of the Russian brown frog 21 substances with antibiotic and other potential uh, medical useful activities. Wow. Uh, Lebedev's team set out to find more of these potential medical treasures. They used a sensitive laboratory technique to expand the list of such substances on this Russian brown frog skin, identifying 76 additional substances. They described lab tests in which some of the substances performed as well against Salmonella and Staphylococcus bacteria as some prescription antibiotic medicines. These peptides could potentially uh, could be potentially useful for the prevention of both pathogenic and antibiotic resistant bacterial strains, while their action may also explain the traditional experiences of the rural Russian population. So, <clears throat> as much as, like, <laughs> I just love this. I don't know, but the, the question I always have, they're like, okay, so it worked. And great, there was some citizen scientific guess and check stuff going on in the past, but 
Yeah. <laughs> Whose idea? <laughs> how does that start? Does a frog just happen to end up in the milk? And they're like, oh, no, there's a frog in the milk. But <laughs> how well this milk is blasted? This I milk have a very important question of mm -hmm. whether the frog is alive or dead when it's in the milk. <laughs> You know, it doesn't say, but I assume it's a frog. It can live in, you know, they can live in murky, muddy swamp yeah, but water. Why not? They milk? also, they're also an animal that defecates, and then you have them defecating in your milk. Ew. Well, there's that <laughs> too, I suppose. Ew. But you know, I think the peptides take care of it. Apparently, it works. Apparently, it preserves the milk. Otherwise, the rural Russians of the past frog. would not have done it. I don't think they put... Well, maybe. I think it's it got to be a dead frog. It doesn't Also say because, here. like, you know, amphibians breathe through their skin, and mm -hmm. I don't know what in milk would be a problem, but I feel like there'd be some problem with them living in milk. Candace I Burrell think in the there would be point. a Keeps flies away huge from the milk. problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and mm. uh, you'll say that, good point. Fish, poop, and water. Yeah, but you don't generally drink water straight from a lake, for example. Not anymore we don't, but no. for years and years of the Russian rural past, we Also, we along. big body of water. Lots of dilution. One frog, <laughs> but small one carton. Frog. Could, what if it's a small frog? Still. It's the little small frogs. Oh, it depends on the compounds and, you know, how potent they are as antibiotics. I mean, we do know that like poison dart frogs, for instance, all you have to do is just rub the little tip of an arrow on the back of the frog and you can do some serious damage. It's not a lot of stuff. Yeah. I would not like to drink milk that has had a poison dart frog in it. No, no. no. That's, that's pretty amazing. This one Russian brown frog has, nine, what is it, 91, 92 now? 90-something discovered uh, antibacterial peptide properties. That's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, we can use in medicine. All from one frog. And only discovered, really, because people used to put frogs in milk. I think that I, I, there is so much to be gained from going back and scientifically testing um, the kind of cultural wisdom. You know, mm -hmm. the, the wives' tales that are passed down, the... the the stories, the, oh, well, if you do this, this is going to happen. If this is going to, you know, don't break a mirror, whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, figure out where it came from. Be like, okay, let's actually test this. Mm -hmm. I think there's that a, sounds there's like a, a TV show that I think already exists. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, mm -hmm. but except instead of uh, stuntmen, uh, you have scientists. Yeah. Right. Science! Right. <laughs> Real science! Mm -hmm. I, I think I there's a the show, treasure but, trove there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think it is uh, it is interesting because you, I mean there always has to be some way that you know it took us a long time to figure out a lot of these things in the environment what we can eat what we can't eat somebody had to eat it and die uh, <laughs> and then somebody had to know what they ate when they died so that yeah. they didn't eat the same things like I don't know he just died I have no reason why all these berries are good a little bitter Ooh, but we should try berries. some so somebody had to know why you ate the thing you had to be live you had to survive the poison to make the connection to warn other people. So there's this whole horrible guess and check process where we may not have been able to transmit knowledge as efficiently or just test something before turning it into food or yeah. trying to turn it into food. But uh, yeah, I mean, who? how do they figure out how to eat like, you know, tubers? Like they weren't good just out of the ground. <laughs> you had to cook. Like, had, had there's so many cook. things we had to cook to figure out that was edible. Right, and there are all sorts of there. There are all sorts of tubers that are really toxic. Many mm. potatoes that are very uh, species of potatoes and mushrooms very toxic. Some species of potatoes have to be eaten with uh, with clay in the diet to allow uh -huh. for your body to actually get take the toxins out. Interesting. Yeah. So there's all sorts of culinary de delights out there. <laughs> We've learned to learn to eat and take advantage of. Uh, Blair. Uh huh. Oh, everyone out there, this is This Week in Science. If you are currently <laughs> tuned in, Blair! Yes, ma'am. Are you ready? It is time for Blair's Animal Corner. Blair's Animal Corner! With Blair, works at a zoo, likes hippos, is not fond of bandits. I need to record that and make that my ringtone or something. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, anyway, so 
Uh, let's talk about some gay fish, shall, shall we? What do you think? There so, are gay fish? Gay fish. Hmm. How is that, like, wait a sec. Before we, before we get too far down this, this road, how, how can you, how can you tell? Because isn't the way, the, isn't fish intercourse? I think we had this conversation before. They don't really have intercourse, don't they? Lay it's eggs and direct. then spawn, the spawning and the yes. releasing yes. of the, yeah. <laughs> so, and wait, yes. wait. So, <laughs> it will all be explained. Okay, Patient. just listen. Okay. Listen, listen to the wise words fish. of Blair. <laughs> Question I've always had in the back of my mind. <laughs> so, Atlantic mollies. We know mollies as one of the very common um, pet store fish. Mollies. The males will nip near the genital openings of potential mates to signal their readiness to mate. And the females will pick their male who they want, uh, like, which basically who they want to get the st sperm donation from, right? Based on the So, fish play. based on, well, usually it's things like their size and how colorful they are and all of this, but the nipping is kind of the last part, it's the foreplay, if you will, before... <laughs> um, the actual act. So what they found is that there's this thing called uh, mate copying in the animal kingdom, very common, where basically if I'm a female and I'm picking a male that I think is the most fit to be the genetic donor to my offspring, if I see him mating with someone else or exhibiting mating behaviors with someone else, I can assess his fitness and he might actually end up being a better choice than someone I haven't seen exhibiting m mating behavior. So that's wow. mate copy. Okay. It's very different than I yes. think humans. Yeah. <laughs> Although you could you could argue that it does happen in humans as well because if you see a man flirting with a woman uh, and he's good at it, you might end up finding yourself attracted to him. Walk over there have a little competition. It happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's right. Actually, yeah. yeah. The the worst time to meet somebody is when you're single because they're like, oh, there must be a reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, the so basically, so mollies do this mate copying. But the males that are less fit have problems finding a female originally to flirt with. What they found is that the males, the the less fit males will actually flirt with other males. And the females will respond to it. Huh. Right. So So flirting with other males actually intrigues females. Right. And they also even looked at the fact that mollies can definitely discern between the sexes. There's pheromones, there's visual cues. They definitely know what they're doing. They're not getting confused and thinking it's it's a female molly. It's definitely a male molly that they're flirting with, but they're doing it in front of a female that they're trying to attract. Hmm. Well, that's a that's a so, so, so they're using a the male. He's got a wingman. Yeah. Yes. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna, like man, yeah. I'm gonna tell you a bunch of jokes. I know these are terrible. Just just laugh like you're just dying over here. And right. just yeah. trying to get her attention over there. Just pretend yeah. I'm just busting That's you. That's exactly what it is. And yeah. so also they found that they they really looked at this very closely and the homosexual interactions had the exact same influence on females' preferences as the heterosexual ones. So it didn't matter if you were flirting with a female or a male it got another female interested. Hmm. Hmm. And so they say the implications are that sexual activity per se is a trait used by females to evaluate males quality and that our results could also be true in other species. So yeah. flirting in general yes. allows yes. females to see whether or not you are interesting. Right. right. Yeah. But even if you think about what qualities do you have? How good are they? So most species, the females pick the male. Yeah. And you can argue in humans which way that actually goes. I think that's kind of a dead-end conversation because we're a little more complicated than that. However, if you think about just very simply <laughs> when a girl is acting maybe a little flirtatious with another girl, usually guys really like that. 
This this is true. Yeah. This is uh, very very thoroughly well documented. Yes, and, you could uh, also I, argue so the that converse there sources. that the the boys that find out later that they're gay in high school usually have a lot of girlfriends. That's, that's Think about it. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> but so very interesting. Back to reality. It doesn't matter who you flirt with if you're a Molly. Either way is good. <laughs> that's, I think that's the good tagline at the end. Good mm. take-home story. Mm. Did you have one more story? I did. So zebra finches, mm -hmm. one of the favorite bird species of researchers. Right? I love them. I did years of zebra finch research. That's right. Meep, meep, so meep, meep. Doodaloo, doodaloo. Meep, they have meep. brooding and asynchrony. So they hatch, their eggs hatch, don't, they don't hatch at the same time. They incubate them as they lay them, and sometimes it takes over four days for all of their eggs to hatch. What they've found is that the order in which the eggs hatch, where you were in the hatching order, affects your behavior for your entire life. Hmm. So if you're the middle spawn, you might be asking for more attention than... <laughs> <laughs> You're first hatched. So how did they how did they figure this out? Okay, so what they did was they took some zebra finch eggs and they incubated them in a specific way so they had hatching synchrony. They all hatched at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then they had other ones that hatched over a period of days. And then they tested their behavior of over a hundred offspring as adults. The big thing they found was that the youngest birds from asynchronously hatched clutches, say that five times fast, mm -hmm. explored their environment more widely. They were more adventurous. Hmm. And the youngest. This, the the youngest. Last and this, this does make sense because if you think about it, there's a bird that's four days older than you. They're probably going to be able to push you to the side and get a lot more food. So it will benefit yeah. you to look farther to try to get the nutrients that you need. Right. And it will behoove you for the rest of your life to maintain that behavior because there's probably somebody else in front of you in line for territory, for mm -hmm. mates, etc. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. And so um, what they specifically had them look at to test how adventurous they were is they took these males and put them in a brand new environment with feeders all over. And so the feeders were new, the area was new, everything was new. The youngest offspring always went to feeders more often in the new space. They gave them 30 minutes, and those younger ones went to every possible feeder, tried to hmm. get every bit of food they possibly could. The other ones hung back a little bit, waited, tried to observe. So they had to take more risks to get the food that they need, essentially. But it's it is very interesting that you it's not a genetic thing unless there is something genetic affecting how long it takes them to hatch, but probably not. It just has to do with when they are laid as an egg. Mm. So it's really not a genetic link at all. This is a one hundred percent environmental influence right. on this animal's behavior that affects their entire life. I think that's really interesting that just yeah. something as simple as when you were hatched can affect your tactics for your entire life. Is it yeah. when they're hatched, but do they all come out at the same time? Well, that was the, the point. Is they sometimes they, they're they asynchronous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're asynchronous. So you can you can, if the temperature is a particular way, it can end up being synchronous hatching where they all hatch about the same time, but there's also asynchronous, so that situation occurs where there is always going to be some somebody hatching before somebody else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and four days in uh, the bird world for a chick actually is <laughs> quite a size difference. It's a long from time. From the oldest to the youngest, yeah, they yeah. could be twice the size of the younger in the brood. It's very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So. Cool. I wonder, and, and I'd love to compare this to, you know, mammalian 
other research. Of course. There is that kind of a, uh, a novelty-seeking trend in the youngest offspring of any yeah. clutch of animals. And then you start to think about sibling situations where they're not clutches, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of research that can be done here um, behaviorally. I think, it's, I think it's a very interesting area to look at. Although I think I think much of that research would uh, would have to be done on the parents themselves because <laughs> the first kid it's like no 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 don't touch don't 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 do this don't do that you'll break your leg you'll fall over this you'll knock that's gonna land on you and then by the time like the third or fourth kid comes along it's like yeah just uh, just don't kill yourself kid <laughs> right <laughs> well I would say that's strictly a human thing but it's not really first time parents in the animal kingdom do treat their their babies differently than mm -hmm. when they've had a few. It it is um, that is an interesting point to be made, especially with a animals that give a lot of parental care. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. It's parents, not nature. So <laughs> nature versus nurture. It's both. <laughs> it's both. They both have amazing influences, and do you know what time it is now? It's time for us to take a break. So, uh, already? Two. I was just getting into the whole thing. I was doing the show and science. Just, and it's stuff. just a break. It's just oh, a little we're coming break. back. We're oh, coming we're, back. we're coming back in a few. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. This is awesome. And I'm, and I'm coming back with some venomous primates. That's I've got viral with. raccoons. I'm going to counter your venomous pi primates. With. <laughs> and I'll raise you. Woodwind. Excellent. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few moments. Behold the Oklahoma plain Planted with a single strain A blanket spun from golden grain A trillion stalks of wheat On every stalk a perfect head The kernels keep the combines fed Then off to manufacture bread So everyone can eat Ain't it beautiful? Ain't it clever? Ain't it just about the best news ever? A farmer feeds a nation Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks, and they are offering a free audiobook download if you sign up with them for a trial of their service right now. They have over 100,000 books in their, in their library, and so there's definitely going to be something there that you will find to enjoy. So if you've never tried Audible before, you're not going to lose anything. You just have to gain. You'd just be gaining here. It's great. It's, go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Right now for your own free audiobook download. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. You can head over to twist.org. Our science music compilation CD is still available, as are some sizes of our World Robot Domination T-shirt. Additionally, you can go to our new store over at Zazzle, Zazzle, Z-A-Z-Z-L-E dot com slash This Week in Science. So it's Zazzle.com slash This Week in Science. Um, we've got lots of merchandise for you so that you can sport your love for of Twist and uh, and support us at the same time. Twist is additionally supported by donations from listeners like you and your donations pay for hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things that we occasionally try to do um, and probably going to pay for a new mixing board here in a couple of days. We appreciate any amount that you can offer that you can give us two dollars two thousand dollars two million yes I would like it you make this show possible we accept donations through PayPal and have made the process incredibly easy by putting PayPal donation buttons on the uh, sidebar of our website and additionally at the bottom of each show page so you can go to our website twist.org Go to the most recent episode, listen to it, scroll down through the show notes, check out what we were talking about, maybe make a comment, and click on a pink button and donate. It is that easy. We thank you for your support. 
We really couldn't do it without you. About a half a world away An Afghan farmer starts his day He swings a scythe to cut his hay He threshes it by hand He grows a mix of wheat out here And when the weather turns austere A strain or two may persevere Enough to meet demand Ain't it beautiful? Ain't it clever? Ain't it just about the best news ever? And we are back. Though I don't know where Justin is. He's gone someplace else. But I have venomous primates. Yay. <laughs> Yay, venomous primates! Awesome! And these venomous primates are actually pretty cute to look at at the same time. Uh, researchers checking out the jungles of Borneo have found a new species of slow lorries. Mm. Yes, slow lorries. And... Uh, they classified two previously known subspecies as distinct species and a completely new species called the cayenne lorries. And so I'm going to see if I can uh, give you a, a screen share so you can see what mm -hmm. these little, little guys look like. Um, so this venomous primate look into its eyes look into its eyes mm. it is it will stare you down and um they're very cute but pretty dangerous you don't want to be bitten by these animals um the cayenne loris has a gland on its elbow which it can lick and this gland produces um a poison. It's a poison gland. And it licks its elbow, mixing the poison with its saliva, making it a venomous biter. So when it bites you, that poison is in its saliva mm. and will uh, will affect you. Um, I, I did not know that there were venomous primates or even... Uh, that, that was news to me. Did you know this? Did you, did you know this? The only venomous mammal I knew about was platypus. That was it. Mm. Which it's under their nails. But I, wait, wait. So tell me again. So it's a it's a gland on their elbow, elbow that makes a poison. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So this this is something that then they have in their mouth and they bite and the poison gets into your body. Into your body. Yeah. It's transferred via saliva. See, this is weird. I don't. I guess poison on the elbow, lick the elbow. Yeah. As opposed to poison, this is like a very gray area for me. Yeah, it's not. It's not necessarily venom that, uh, as in snakes, where they have the venom right. gland that is pumped out through their uh, their fangs as right. they bite, or even like a spider that the same idea. The venom mm -hmm. comes through the pulps as they bite. Um, yeah, but poison is usually an ingestible, so I don't really know what you would call this other than venom. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And the loris mm. is also really interesting. Um, this is something that I also did not know. They have a, uh, a, a strange arrangement, a very interesting arrangement of blood vessels in their hands and feet so that they can hang on branches or grasp branches for hours and hours and hours and not have their hand or feet if hands or feet go to sleep mm. so the blood continues to flow taking taking metabolites away and uh, bringing new oxygen oxygenated blood to those limbs and those muscles yeah it's great really nifty. So anyway, slow lorries, and this mm. is a new species called Nyctisebus cayenne, which is named for the Cayenne River, which runs through the central east section of Borneo. Hmm. Yes. Venom. That's very interesting. Yeah, watch out for those cute creatures. Yeah. If you guys want to laugh, you should really uh, YouTube search slow loris 
and uh, there's lots of amazing videos because they're actually boutique pets in Japan, which is a horrible, horrible thing. They should not yeah. be pets. They're very hard to keep. Most of them die. But there's lots of ridiculous videos of Slow Loris is like being ridiculous because of that. So you should check it out. <laughs> <laughs> check Same. out YouTube videos of Slow yes. Loris. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Justin, what did you bring? What do you want to talk about now? You know, I, I have this, uh, what sounds like a very groundbreaking story uh, that I want to do. But I've been completely sidetracked and utterly stunned uh, by Gord McLeod's post on Science with a Twist. Uh, is a, uh, a, a, a current uh, article in Scientific American about Western chimpanzees. And it's filled with things I had no idea. They're, they're putting forth uh, the question of whether or not the Western chimpanzees should be considered a new uh, species of pan uh, troglodyte. This is, uh, it's just kind of, we, we may have to delve into this more next week uh, as I can have a chance to actually re read the stories. Um, but here's some of, the, some of the observations that they've made. Uh, so far, one is that genetically they have they were separate from other chimpanzees, Eastern champions, for the last five hundred thousand years. They hmm. they use caves as places to socialize and sleep. They live in a sort of uh, mosaic environment that's like woodland, savanna, which is most chimpanzees live in completely forested environment. So their environment uh, is different. They can predict the movement of fire. When a fire breaks out, they can, you know, manage to avoid it properly. They construct spears to hunt other primates. What? Yes. Uh, what? They, sh they share plant foods, which is one of those things that uh, last week's disclaimer was one of the things that was sort of I'd been doing some reading uh, on dogs and how, you know, we, a, a dog will point out to another dog where there's food, which is something apes never do. You know, and so I was sort of pondering, like maybe it was mankind's interaction with canines over the years that made us better at uh, collaborating on things because apes don't do that. No ape finds a piece of food and is like, "Hey, look over here, everybody! I found. Look, there's food over." They just go get it, you know, and eat it themselves. Uh, and others may observe them and do the same, but they don't uh, coordinate that. But they share plant foods. These these Western chimpanzees. Uh, they feed disproportionately on termites compared to other populations. They travel and forage at night, soak themselves, and even play in water, which most apes won't have anything to do with. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Wow. So it says here, these discoveries have forced scientists to rethink behavioral variation among chimpanzee subspecies because eastern champions, chimpanzees have never been observed to behave in any of these ways that we've been talking about here. And 500,000 years of uh, separation seems like a good amount of time uh, for there to be quite a big difference. Should they be considered a different species with the genus Pan? <laughs> so two things about this terrify me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Chimps in general are my... One of my only animal fears, definitely my number one animal fear, because they are so smart. So now we found a smarter chimpanzee. <laughs> yeah. That's terrifying. Second, I've always been told, and it has always been my plan, that if I was ever being chased by a chimp, that I would jump into water because they're terrified of water. And now you've told me that these <laughs> ones are not. These ones, they f they frolic. In the I don't <laughs> like it. Yeah. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wow. Huh. We're going to have to learn more about the Western chimpanzee on this show. We're going to have to... Because this, be, this might be our closest, uh, closest thing we have to understanding uh, what would have been a missing link at some point if they're engaging in behaviors that we have long considered to be human and not ape -like. Well, it's, it's similar in uh, some respects to the bonobos that have been... Um, allowed a, a separate I, I believe they've been allowed a, they, they mm -hmm. have a separate species 
they are a separate species. They've been separated for a significant, significantly long time, but they've gone the other direction of uh, they're they're very smart, but they uh, they're very peaceable. They don't have the same aggressiveness that chimpanzees do. Right, but then again, that's because they're constantly engaging in orgies. <laughs> there is that, and they're that also and really they're good. also mostly vegetarian too. Yeah. They are vegetarian and all about the orgasm. Promiscuous, yes. Yes. So I think that does. I think that that we may there may be a fantastic lesson for future societies um, in studying <laughs> in studying the the different outcomes of of ape um, behavior. That's right. Uh, but it's the groundbreaking nice story, which is uh, was you know is aptly being said because I. I believe it was about the ground. This is a uh, ground break. University of Oregon researchers who were looking at uh, these ancient multicellular fossils in Australia, which were thought to be the ancestors themselves of early marine life. This early marine, uh, early marine life, which then, uh, of course maybe begot into begettings uh, on and on into what became life on earth All right. the uh, this is this is very interesting um, Gregory Redlack who's been studying these fossils of South Southern Australia goes eh, not so much early marine life more likely remnants of land dwelling lichen or other microbial colonies so this is this is very uh, this is very interesting. Um, the fossils date 542 to 635 million years ago. Hmm. They have been considered to be fossil jellyfish, worms, sea pens, uh, but are preserved in a way distinct from marine invertebrate fossils. The fossils first discovered in 1946, Australia's Idiacara Hills, are found in iron-colored impressions. Similar to what you'd see, like a like a plant fossil, right? So it's not it's not like because there's no bones, obviously, right? But it leaves a chemical imprint into the rock, and that's how you know it was there. Redlick, who is actually a native of Australia, examined ancient uh, Edicarian soil with an array of state-of-the-art chemical and microscopic techniques, including an electron microscope, scanning electron microscope and some other very long-winded acronym microscopy things. Uh, <laughs> the soil with fossils, uh, he writes in his study, are distinguished by a surface called old elephant skin, which is best preserved by undercovering sandstone beds. The healed cracks and lumpy appearances of sandy old elephant skin are most like the surface of microbial soil crusts in modern deserts. The discovery has implications for the tree of life because it removes idiocarin fossils from the ancestry of animals. We just lost a major precursor to life on Earth. Oh my goodness. Maybe what? are we gonna all disappear? Is it like back to the future <laughs> where it's like, oh no! no! Our parents never met, and then now we're going to slowly disappear unless we can get the flux capacitor back online. Um his evidence, mostly gathered from the site in the uh, in the Flander Ranges, is presented in a paper placed online ahead of print by the journal Nature. These fossils have been first class have been a first class scientific mystery. He says they are the oldest large multicellular fossils. They lived immediately before the Cambrian evolutionary explosion that gave rise to the familiar modern groups of animals. Uh, again, this is always thought to have been a seabed, uh, but his studies, uh, the fossils determine that the diversity reflects preference by ancient organisms for unfrozen, low salinity soils, rich in nutrients, most like terrestrial organisms. Wow. We've got to go back to the, got to go back to the drawing board. And I wonder, I also kind of, like, the, the side thought is I also start to wonder then, like, well, if these aren't the precursors, does that mean life could have started on land first? Or does it mean that we have a uh, pushback even even further, the, the original, uh, you know, first, first life on, on Earth? 
Implications for a variety of other fossils that could have been lichens, other microbial consortia, of fungal fruiting bodies, slime molds, flanged pedestals of biological soil crust. Uh, we we didn't start out quite where we are now. <laughs> he said this, this all this all these fossils represent an independent evolutionary radiation of life on land that pre seeded by at least 20 million years the Cambrian evolutionary explosion of animals in the sea. Yeah. Wow. So basically there's this just other lineage that got on land and went its own direction and then kind of petered out. Could be. Our, I mean, that's then, how he's representing it. So there's, there's maybe a, an so, ancestor that's further back. Yeah. Yeah. That's how he's representing it, although, well... You, now we must we must keep pondering <laughs> because really I'd love to hear no, more about it. Well, because here's the amazing here's here's the really here's the like more fascinating potential of this discovery.